Well, it's hard to believe, but we've come to week four yep. of OC Summer Heat. Yay. It's been good, right? Awesome. I'm, yes. I'm already looking forward to next year. <laughs> I know. We've had a great time and yep. so many like on-time words right. each and every week. Yep. And it's just been a lot of fun too. But today we're going out with a bang because today we've got Michael yes. Jr. in the yes. house with us yes. today. Now, if you know, you know, but maybe you're not familiar with Michael Jr. Let me just tell you a little bit about him. Yeah. He's truly one of the most gifted communicators in the world. Yes. He's brought his comedy uh, to places like The Tonight Show. Jimmy Kimmel has been featured on Comedy Central. Hey. He's been in movies like War Room and Selfie Dad. And he's a best-selling author. Books like uh, Funny How Life Works, among others. Yep. And he's got a table in the back after service yep. where you can buy his books. There's a marriage kit there yes. for those interested in that. But the resources are back there. Um, it is going to be yes. a great morning. Yes. We've been looking forward to this all summer yeah. long. So Oaks Church, would you get on your feet and welcome Michael, Michael Jr. Jr. Sit down. I ain't even, I ain't do nothing. Just sit down. What do, all right, we got some fun. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. And thanks for taking me out to eat the other day. What was that place? Hooters. Ah, oh, it was delicious. <laughs> I'm just playing. We didn't, I didn't go. He went by himself. <laughs> Yo, man, thanks, man. You guys have been so loving to me. Ever since I walked through the door, your leadership is dope. I appreciate it so much. I'm excited to be here. Man, we're going to have so much fun. We're going to laugh and stuff. Um, it's early. We're going to laugh. Some people think you shouldn't laugh in church. And my response to that is always, what good father doesn't want to hear his children's laughter in his house? So we're going to be able to laugh. It's going to be fun. And if you don't laugh for some reason, it's okay. They already gave me a check. I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. Don't just... <laughs> I'm just serious. Um... So there's two verses of scripture that is going to apply to what I talk about today. You don't have to read them right now, but when you go home, read them. I think they'll pop in a new way as a result of what we talk about today. So those verses are Jeremiah 29, 11, And then there is John 10, 27. And I'm going to add another one too. Uh, Second Romans 3. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just playing. I was just making sure y'all read the Bible because... If your Bible got a second Romans, you need to take it back to Dollar Tree. That's what you should do. <laughs> take it back to Dollar Tree. Then we're going to go to Revelations 3.20. Add that to the list. So um, I also want to say, oh, there's some cool stuff. If you guys want to uh, buy, I wrote a book and some other stuff. it will be in the lobby afterwards. Also, me and my wife created a marriage course called Funny How Marriage Works. It helps people understand marriage. The reason I'm mentioning that stuff is because all of the proceeds, there's so much stuff going on in the world we decided to do with the proceeds is going to, um, to, to a black family in America. So. <laughs> so you can buy all that stuff if you want to. So basically, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, uh, I'm gonna to walk you. This is an awesome church. This church is beautiful. Like, this is, like, we're going to have some fun. All right. So I'm basically going to tell you, like we've already laughed a little bit at church. So I'm going to give you some of my story, and then we'll see what we do with it at the end. But when I was a kid, going to church, laughing at church was illegal. You couldn't laugh at I remember one time I was seven years old, right? I'm seven years old. My grandmother forced me to go to this church, and this lady was jumping around, and her wig fell off. I cracked up laughing. It was the first time I ever laughed at church. My grandmother would pinch and twist. I can understand a pinch. You gonna twist? That's probably the devil. That's what I was thinking. That's the devil right there. So I'm, I don't understand what's, this is, this is my church experience. I'm just gonna share with you my church experience. I'm seven years old, I go to church. My shoes are like three sizes too small. And my grandmother had this thing called a shoehorn. So if your foot don't fit, now it do. The church lasts six hours, so my toes is all balled up in this thing. And I walk into church, and this dude is up on stage, and he was mad at everybody. This is my experience. He mad at everybody, and I think he was mad because he had some phlegm caught in his throat. Because at the end of every sentence, he would try to get it out. 
He'd be like, the Lord said, ah. act like you're, ah. I'm like, grandma, you need to gargle or something. And he had a Bible in his hand. He kept playing like he was going to throw it at people. The Lord said, ha, ah, ah, and people would get scared. They'd be like, hey, man, hey, man. I realize now they were saying, hey, man. Oh, this is my amazing, beautiful daughter, by the way. She is going to help me out in any way she can. I love this. <laughs> right, before I, right before I got on stage, she asked me to give her, uh -uh, and I'm going to do it because you came up here. I appreciate you. She's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. I just, I just put it right back where it was. So seven... Hey, here's a, this is not my son. I don't know who this is. This is a random. I don't. I do not have that. <laughs> Nothing happened in college. I don't know where this dude came from. <laughs> I'm just being completely serious. So I'm seven years old. Church was there. <laughs> you just got that just now, didn't you? Like, not having a college. So church was miserable. You understand? My clothes were too tight. My shoe. I, I used to always wear a white, a white and brown shirt every day to church every single Sunday. It was actually just white, but it was so tight when the buttons, so it looked like it was brown in between here, but that was flesh. So church was 100% miserable and nobody was explaining that. Like nobody was explaining what was going on. It was just scary. And one time I went to church, it was a dead body in the front. Nobody explains to a seven-year-old Michael Jr. This is, this is a funeral. I'm thinking, yo, that's how they roll. <laughs> like every few weeks or so, they bring a dead body in as an example or something. <laughs> the dude on stage would yell at us like we did it. I asked my grandma, I was like, Grandma, what happened to the man in the box? What happened to the man in the box? Her whole explanation was, he in a better place. <laughs> I'm like, what kind of box did he live in before? <laughs> Church was a miserable, you understand. It was, we weren't laughing at all at church. And then 14 years old, instead of forcing me to go to church, my grandmother did something different. She asked me if I wanted to go. She gave me an option. I was like, let me think about this, Grandma. No. So I didn't go to church. I just hung out with my friends. And we were broke growing up. I ain't had no money. I was actually being sponsored by a family from Haiti. <laughs> That's a funny joke, man. <laughs> Some Christians don't know what to do with that joke. You can't laugh and shake your head. <laughs> well, you don't have money, you get creative. I remember I wanted an action figure when I was a kid. We ain't had no money. My dad on my birthday handed me a box. I opened it up, it was empty. He said, it's Invisible Man. I played with that thing for three weeks, man. My brother hid it from me, man. We also made a deal around 14 years old, me and a friend, Calvin was his name. We made this deal that we wouldn't curse anymore. This was the deal. If he heard me curse, he could hit me in the chest hard as he wanted to, and vice versa. And dude could hit really hard. So I stopped cursing immediately. We played other games too that were a little violent. Remember Slug Bug? If you're from the East Coast, they call it Punch Bug. Here's how the game works. If you see a Volkswagen Bug, you get to hit your friend. Those are all the instructions. In my neighborhood, they would take this game a little too far. They would add to the game. You ever play Uppercut Fire Truck? <laughs> what about Minivan Body Slam? You ever play that game? <laughs> There's always one crazy dude in the group who would make up games on the spot, like Hitch on the Throat Talk Building. <laughs> you play too much, man. That's my esophagus. <laughs> I also noticed around this age, thinking back, I used to struggle with my reading. I used to struggle a lot with my reading. I read fine now, like the signs over the door that say excite. I can read that stuff. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to struggle with my reading. I couldn't sound words out phonetically. It just didn't work that way. I'd have to look at the word differently. I would look at the font size, the color, the positioning, what's in front of it, what's behind it, how people responded to it. I actually came up with seven different ways to look at a word to determine what that word was. Then I got really good at it to the point in high school, people didn't know I wasn't really reading. I was just working it out really, really fast. Now as an adult, I read just fine, but I still have this ability to look at words and people and situations seven different ways almost immediately. In fact, it's the primary place that I pull my comedy from. 
So that very thing from my past, it looked like it was a handicap. It seemed as if I was dealt a bad hand. God didn't cause it, but he's used it in preparation for what he has me to do. It's almost as if I was practicing, even though I didn't know I was practicing. Let me say this again so you can hear what I'm saying. That thing from your past, the fact that you never met your dad before, your mom was an alcoholic, you were molested as a child. God did not cause that, but he'll use it in preparation for what he has for you to do. Chances are, maybe you've been practicing. You didn't know you were practicing. I'm here to let you know you've been practicing. Maybe someone needs to hear your story so they can be set free and you can too. You've been practicing. But for a lot of you guys, it is game time. But you have to be able to hear the coach's voice. So now for me, as a result of my practice, I find funny everywhere because that's the way my mind thinks. This white dude, this little white kid walked up to me the other day at the airport. I just, I'm funny, just show up. Cool little white kid, he asked for an autograph. I was like, cool, what's your name, buddy? He said, I'm Tanner. I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> People will ask simple questions, but I find them weird sometimes. This guy said to me, um, Michael Jr., where are you from originally? I'm like, originally, huh? Well, I was conceived in Michigan. Before that, I was with my dad. Um, and, uh, then there was a swim competition, right? And, then, uh, and I won, which is crazy, right? Because currently, I don't swim at all, man. But I used to be fast, man. I was fast. I was fast, man. <laughs> That's preparation for the next Bible t study y'all doing. That's all that is. But the Bible says about sex. This is going to be fun. 26 years old, I hope you're tracking. Went from seven, 14, 26 years old, I moved to New York City. Why did I move to New York City? Because I wanna know if I'm funny. I'm doing comedy, but I don't know for sure if I'm funny or not. And in New York, if you're not funny, the way they let you know is they'll say something like, you not funny. <laughs> so there's this comedy club in New York called the Comedy Comic Strip Live. And it's really hard to get into this club. Like really hard. Comedians who are new in town, like myself, which start lining up at six o'clock in the morning for an open mic that takes place at seven o'clock at night. Just so they can put their name in a hat in hopes that their name gets drawn out and they can do 90 seconds of comedy in front of the manager. So it's finally my turn to perform at the Comic Strip Live and right before I get ready to get on stage, this comedian named George Wallace walks in. Very established comedian. When he walks in, whoever's next gets bumped, period. It don't matter. He walks in, the manager's already walking over to me. I'm like, no, I'm about to get bumped. But no, this is where God shows up for the first time in my life. Well, this is where I noticed him. The manager says to me, hey, listen, uh, George Wiles is here, Michael. Would you like to go on before him or after him? You never get an option. You never get an option. I was like, before him, please. So I get up on stage and I'm doing comedy and, and, and New Yorkers are laughing. But then George Wallace walks in and he's laughing too. And then afterwards, there's a bunch of comedians all around him asking him questions. He leaves them and he walks over to me. And he says, you know, you're really funny and you're clean. I was like, wow, thanks, man. He said, let me ask you a question. He was like, why don't you curse? I was like, I don't know if my grandmother walk in or something, man. <laughs> what else? My grandmother ain't coming to New York. What else is it gonna say? My friend might hit me in the chest, I'm a grown man. I didn't have any reason not to curse, but he was like, you know what, you're funny, you're clean. I'd like for you to do a show with me and my best friend in a couple nights. I don't know who the best friend was. I'm excited, I'm pumped. I get to the show, it's me, George Wallace, Jerry Seinfeld. I do two shows. I got two standing ovations. I rip, I'm the man. Let me pause for a second. I'm homeless living in my car at this point in my life too. Literally, I talk about that in the book, but literally in this moment, doing the show, getting standing ovations, I'm going back to sleep in the passenger seat of my 1997 Lumina. So, this, so after the show, I get these two stand ovations. I rip, I feel great. I'm like, yes, this is awesome. And then the, uh, the club manager walks up to me. He says, Mike, you got a great set. He said, let me ask you a question, man. Would you like to go to church with me this weekend? I was like, church? Man, back up, you're making my feet hurt. I ain't going to church. <laughs> Listen, I'm gonna pause real quick and give you something that's crazy deep, but then I'm gonna jump back into the story. This is deep. Some of you guys will get it. Some of you just, just forget about it, okay? I literally had the thought, back up, you're making my feet hurt. 
in retrospect, I remember having that thought. Why did I have that thought? Well, the reason is because every time I went to church as a kid, my shoes were very, very tight and it was very uncomfortable. So I had a negative neural association attached to the discomfort of church from wearing those shoes, assuming it was God and those people who were creepy. Not recognizing the pain that was physically in my feet at the time, actually told my brain to stay away from anything church. So for most of my life, I avoided those people like that, or church or anybody who had a Bible, because of this neural association. But once I got curious about it, found out what it was, realized it's just a lie from being uncomfortable, now I'm more open and ready to receive somebody talking about God. Do you have a negative neural association somewhere because of somebody? Chances are, if you do, it's horizontal. It's not vertical. All right, we'll jump back into the story. So he asked me to go to church. And I was like, nah, I'm cool, man. I ain't going to church, man. I'm, I'm okay. You know? There's only two reasons you do anything in life, by the way. I'm, I'm going to jump back over here to the deep section. There's only two reasons you do anything in life. Test this when you leave. Pick any decision you've ever made. There's two reasons. To avoid pain or to gain pleasure. Only two reasons. This dude asked me to go to church. I was like, nah, I'm cool. Pain. I'm good. 20 minutes later, his fiance asked me to go, and she was fine. <laughs> I'm talking about beautiful. I mean beautiful. She pales in comparison to my wife now. I wish my wife was here. She pales in comparison, but back then, she was fine. And she was, had some sort of accent, too. She was like, Michael Jr., would you like to go to church with us? I was like, I was just looking for a church the other day, man. It's crazy. It's just, uh, so I go to this church for the wrong reasons and I can't even find these people. And then I'm sitting down at the, and I'm sitting there by myself and this dude comes out on stage and he's talking about Jesus, just like Pastor Chris. He's just talking. He's not screaming. He's not yelling. He don't got no perm. He's just talking about Jesus. <laughs> he's just explaining it in a way. And then he did this thing where he did an altar call and he said, if you want Jesus in your life, all you have to do is believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. And raise your hand and, and Jesus is yours. And yo, I really wanted to do it. Like, I really wanted to, but I was like, nah, I got to read the pamphlet first. Because I knew a couple Christians, and they was creepy. There's some creepy Christians out there. If you don't know any creepy Christians, it's you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, your friends know one. Yeah. So I told myself, I was like, ah, this stuff is weird, I'm not. So I told myself before I gave my life over to Jesus, I'd read the Bible first. I even have a Bible. A couple days later, out of nowhere, I'm at like this mall area and this lady, for real, hands me a Bible. We don't even exchange words, she just hand me a Bible. I was like, snap, I guess I gotta, I didn't know it was that big, first of all, the thing was huge. Have you seen one of them things? So I open up the Bible, first thing I read is the copyrights. The Bible was made in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Me too. That's crazy. We never met before. So I'm reading the Bible and I'm going to church because now I really want to get my life over to Jesus. But I told myself I'd read the Bible first. So I'm reading, going to church, reading, got to the part about the job. I'm like, no wonder I don't want one of them. That's crazy, man. Kept reading. Just checking your Bible knowledge. That's all I'm doing. Checking your Bible knowledge. I keep reading. I'm going to church, reading, going to church, and I'm digging into the world. I'm putting in like 12 to 14 hours a day. That was like a chapter a day. Like I'm digging in. I got to the part of Matthew where it said Jesus died for me. I did not know that I was 27 years old that Jesus died for me. I didn't know. I've been to church before. Nobody was explaining the way I could understand. I didn't know until I read it right there in Matthew that Jesus died for me. Then I turned to Mark and he died again. I'm like, what is going on? Then Luke, I get to John, I'm like, why are you going back in the garden, Jesus? You know what's going to happen. No, for real, I wish that was some comedy I wrote. I really thought he died four times. I didn't know. I was like, why is he going back? He know everything. If this cup could be taken, no, it's not. You know what's going to happen. So I finished reading the Bible, and I remember going to church. I was hungry. I, it, I actually, it took me 36 days to read the Bible. 
I finish reading the Bible and I go, to, I go up to church during the announcements. I'm like, hey, is Jesus here now? Or do I got to wait to the end like y'all normally do? Like, what do we got to do? And now I understand some stuff. I used to just think I was funny. Now I understand I'm funny for a reason. There's purpose behind me having a sense of humor and these talents and these skills, just like there's purpose behind you having the skills and the talents that you have as well. And I get some celebrities that you would know who ask questions about God. One dude was like, explain God to me. I was like, what? Like, just explain God? I can't explain. If I could just explain God, he wouldn't be God. And this other dude was like, well, how is it I could do all of these things I'm doing and people still say that that Jesus wants a relationship with me? How is that possible? You know what I'm doing. I'm doing all this stuff. And yeah, he was doing some stuff. And I was like, the only thing I can come up with at the time, and this isn't even close to how awesome God is, but this is all I could come up with. I was like, God is like being in a car with a navigation device. You ever been in a car with a navigation device before? You ever been in a car before? You ever been in a car? Okay. It's like being in a car with a navigation device. If it says go 10 blocks and turn left, then you go three blocks and turn right. It doesn't abandon what you're supposed to do. It recalculates what you need to do to get to where you're supposed to be based upon where you are. The only problem is if you keep making the wrong turns, the road conditions may be different. They may be rougher and you're running out of time. So you have to be sensitive to listen to that voice to make the right choice about where you're supposed to be. And that voice sounds an awful lot like a coach because you haven't been practicing for nothing. It's game time. So now I'm at that point. I have two stories and time for one. And the, uh, the young lady in the white hat, what's your name? Oh, okay, well, never mind. Let me go to somebody a little more friendly. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just, what's your name? Oh, Norma. Hey, Norma, how are you? I have time for two stories. I can tell the story about the first time I was on The Tonight Show on NBC or first time I went to prison. She went to prison. All right, I knew it. I can tell by your first answer. Okay. Cool. So the prison story. Wow, I wasn't expecting that from Norma. So I have a nonprofit called Funny for the Forgotten. We go to homeless shelters and prisons, abuse children facilities. This is my first time ever going into a prison to do comedy. I walk into the prison, the warden takes my belt from me. He's like, you can't have my belt. You can't, you can't have a belt. Somebody might try to hang you. Can't they just boo me like regular people? Like, can't they just, I'm in prison, my pants loose? That's a bad idea, man. I, don't... I got seven different ways to look at this, man. I'm just saying this. So I walk into this prison and I'm scared. As soon as I walk in, like the warden took my belt, but now they got these bars, they open up in front of you, take a few steps, they close, they open, they close. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Welcome home. <laughs> so I'm scared, I'm walking in this prison. I need a joke immediately, right? I need these dudes to like me immediately, but not too much. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I'm walking in and I get in, the, and at first I got like eight prison guards around me. So I'm not feeling too scared. But slowly but surely, I don't know if they're getting hit by darts, but these cats start peeling off. I get to the last set of bars, it's me and Barney Fife, just one skinny dude there. And he's like, hey, this is as far as I go. I'm like, well, me too, man. I don't know what we're going to. But I know God is telling me to go here. I know he is. So I go into this, this area where all these prisoners are, and they're all in this big circle, and there's a little hole in the middle of the circle, and I guess that's where I'm supposed to do comedy. And I'm walking, I look cool on the outside, but I got nothing. Like, no jokes are popping up. No, seven different ways to nothing. Probably got four steps left. Three steps left. Two steps left. Still got nothing. Nothing's popping up. Like, nothing at all. I had one joke pop up. But I didn't feel like I should start with it. I was going to be like, you know what? You guys are a captive audience. I just want to say that. I didn't feel a peace in my spirit about that joke. So I got nothing, one step left. I lift his foot up and I set it down and for real, sitting right up front is a white dude with a white beard named Moses. I was like, thanks, Lord. (laughs) When I said these words, the place exploded in laughter. We had an amazing time. I said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. When you see the prison warden, I want you to look him in his eye. I want you to look him right in his eye and I want you to say, let my people go. (laughs) For real. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? It wasn't as much pressure as you think because I'd been practicing since I was a child in the form of a kid who was struggling with his reading and other things as well. 
I was practicing, just like you've been practicing. Maybe you didn't know you were practicing. I'm here to let you know you've been practicing. Some of you guys have been practicing a lot, even to the point where you're crying inside like a little baby. You can probably hear it right now. Can, can you hear it? You hear it? Cool. Hey, you don't have to take the baby out though, it's fine. I used to be a baby, it's fine. Wait, is that your baby though? Because we just cool with him just taking somebody baby? Is that your baby? Okay, it's your, all right, cool. I guess y'all look alike, I guess. Cool, we're not going. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, I'm gonna try to squeeze this tonight show joke. There's another joke where I did a show. There's a story where I did an event and after the event, this is in the book, after the event, this guy approaches me and asks me if I could turn help him turn himself in to the authorities that he'd been running from for three years. At the end of a comedy show. So doggone powerful. All right, let me see if I can do this. Moved to New York, I moved from New York City, it was too expensive, so I moved to California. <laughs> My cousin had a couch he said I could stay on, which is great. There's a comedy club there that was really hard, it's super hard to get into this comedy, it's so hard to get into this comedy club. Only way I could get into it physically, not even get on stage, is George Wallace was in town. And he takes me to the Comedy and Magic Club. He can't get me on stage, he can only get me in the club. Afterwards, he takes me into the green room. In the green room are some soldiers in comedy. George Wallace, Gary Shanley, Jay Leno, and then me. And I'm sitting here nibbling on french fries, even though they got this big spread of food. But I, didn't, I hadn't contributed anything to these guys while I'm in this green room. I don't even feel like I belong, so I'm just nibbling on fries, even though I'm starving in all sorts of ways. So I'm just sitting there nibbling on fries, and at the time they were working on a joke. Some of you guys may remember a football player got hit in the eye with a flag, and he was suing the league for $400 million because he lost his vision in one eye. Some of you guys remember that. Well, these guys are working on that subject for the monologue on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. They're working on that, that joke subject. I ain't saying nothing, nibbling on fries. Then they got quiet and they looked at me. Your gift will make room for you. They got quiet and they looked at me and I was like, oh snap, this is an opportunity. I was like, all right, let me see if I got this right. He got hit in the eye with a flag. He lost his vision in one eye and he's suing the league for $400 million. He not gonna see half of it. <laughs> for real. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? Wasn't that much pressure. I've been practicing. Just like you've been practicing. It's game time. But you have to be able to hear the coach's voice. So now me and my wife, we were looking at some old home videos recently. It wasn't super old, it wasn't like a VHS or whatever. Some of the young people was like, what's up a hush? Whatever. <laughs> We're looking at some old home videos and we came across a video of our youngest daughter being born. The video I'm about to, the clip I'm about to show you, I took the video. But I didn't understand the power of the video until I sat back and watched the video. So powerful. So let me set it up. This is our youngest daughter and she's, um, at the time she, she's like two and a half minutes old. And they got her under a little chicken warmer, a little, I don't know what kind of insurance we had, the thing to keep the fries warm, that's they had her under that thing. And she's sitting under there. I took, I, I'm taking this video. This thing blows me up. And they're, they're trying to keep her warm with the thing or whatever. And then she starts to cry. I want you to notice what happens when she hears my voice. Okay, for it. Look, I'm right here. It's okay. It's okay. I'm right here. I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay. It's okay. I'm right here. Right here. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay, baby. Yo. That was pretty powerful. Now it's like seven, seven and a half minutes or so later. The nurse is done cleaning her up and she starts to cry again. I speak up and she stops crying again but I want you to notice what happens when I tell her I love her. Portland, right. Portland, it's okay, it's okay, it's good, it's good, it's good. I'm right here, I'm right here, I am right here. I love you, I love you, I love you. 
Yeah, I'm right here. I'm right here. It's okay. It's okay. So here's the thing. There's going to be times in life where you feel like you've just been practicing and practicing and practicing. And things seem really, really hard. Even to the point of tears. The key thing to do in those moments is to be still and listen for the Father's voice. Because He is talking to you. And what He wants you to know is that He's right here. He loves you. All you have to do is open your eyes. You hear some music? Yeah, yeah. Not yet, man. You're too early. You're getting us emotional, man. It's not yet. It's not yet. It's not. I got one more story I need to tell, man. You sliding in there with your smooth, getting us all emotional. I'm like, Lord, is that you? No, it's not. It's, it's that dude right there. Just I got one more story. <laughs> so there's one more story I want to tell, but first I want to tell you how I came up with the story. And after I tell you how I came up with it, then that dude is supposed to slide in right there. That was smooth. Are you married? You are. I know you are. You smooth. That's why you are. That brother's smooth, but he's like, don't, don't, hey, girl. That's how, that's how it happened. That's how it happened. All right, so, the, so this is a story about having a relationship with Jesus. And the way I came up with this story is I was doing what I always do. I was writing comedy. And I was writing a joke about the good room. Raise your hand. How many people here know what the good room is? Raise your hand. See, there's like no hands going up. The reason is I never finished a joke. But the truth is, is mostly all of you know what the good room is. Let me explain. The good room is that room, it's the room in your grandmother's house or your aunt's house. Probably your house. It's that one room that's better than the rest of the house. Can't nobody go in there and splash it on the furniture. It's really just for looks. How many people know what the good room is now? <laughs> you got three of them, don't you? Anyway, um, it's that where, like nobody can go, it's plastic on the furniture, it's just, it's, it's the good room. So I was writing this joke about the good room, and in the middle of writing this joke, God stopped me and told me to tell this story to his people. And right now, I feel like I should tell you this story, so I'm going to share this story with you. Now would be a great time to jump in, man, if you want to slide in right there. <laughs> He's early and late. That is amazing. How you pull that off? You both. So I want everyone in here, anyone watching online, I want you to imagine, this is a story about having a relationship with Jesus. I want you to imagine that you are a house, that you are a house. And outside of the house is Jesus Christ. And he wants to come in. But he'll never force his way in. He actually wants you to invite him in. And the reason some people in this room or watching online, the reason some of you haven't invited Jesus into the house is because you're cool with the way things are right now. So it would seem. Whenever you need something, you just walk up to the door, crack it open, say a little prayer, tell them what happened, then close the door and go back into the house. But that's not a relationship at all. How can you hear his voice under those circumstances? How can you truly utilize the practice that he didn't cause, but he will use under those circumstances? And the reason we'll let him into the house is because your house is a mess. And you think you need to clean it up first. How's that working out for you? There may be drugs, pornography, or you just volunteering and staying extra busy trying to be distracted from the mess. Or relationships, you brought other people in the house hoping that maybe they could help you clean it up. But they can't. The only one who can clean it up is standing outside the door wearing an apron with a bucket in his hand, waiting on you to truly open the door. Then there's other people in here right now who used to have Jesus in the whole house. But whether you realize it or not, you've moved him to just one room in the house. The good room. Have you ever noticed how the good room most of the time is the one right up front with the big window? So when people look in, they think the whole house is clean, but it's not, it's just that one room. So when they hear about you coming to church, they think the whole house is clean, but it's not, it's just that one room. You quote scripture, but it's just that one room. You give money, but it's just that one room. 
You got a Bible app on your phone, but it's just that one room. Scripture tattooed on your body. But it's just that one room. Jesus wants access to the whole house. And I'm telling you, if you would just open this door and let him in, he'll show up with a contractor named the Holy Spirit. And they will make sure the house is fully functioning the way it was intended to. But none of this happens if you don't open the door. Because he will not, he will never force his way in. He wants you to invite him in. So if everyone in here, you've been watching online, if you can close your eyes and bow your hair for a moment. If you're in here right now and you know that I'm talking to you, that you need to invite Jesus into your house, whether it be for the first time or to give him full access to the house again, I want you to do something really simple, really simple. On the count of three, I just simply want you to put your hand in the air. Don't overthink this, but on the count of three, just put your hand in the air. One, two, three. Nice and high. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Awesome. Now put your hand down and look up at me. First of all, let me say this. I am proud of you. Now listen. More times than not, God will tell me a number of how many times to repeat that phrase because there's some people in this room who have not received that phrase from a father's voice before. And I'm going to repeat that phrase and all I want you to do is to work to receive it from a father's voice. I am proud of you. 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 Now, this is for everyone who raised their hand and even those who should have raised their hand. On the count of three, what I'm going to ask you to do, see, Jesus says he will take a stand for me. Jesus says I will take a stand for you if you will take a stand for me before men. He'll take a stand in front of the Father. So what I want everyone in this room who raised their hand and even those who should have raised their hand, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet so we can pray together. When you raise your hand, it's as if you were reaching for the doorknob. But when you stand up and we pray together on the count of three, it's as if you're blowing the door open so Jesus can come into the house. If you can't do this in here where we're proud of you, you won't be able to do it out there. So again, on the count of three, everyone who raised their hand, and even those who should have raised their hand, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet and remain standing. And to help with that, everyone around you, they're going to applaud as loud as they can, but it will not compare to the applause that the angels in heaven will be doing when you stand to your feet and remain standing. One, two, three. Just stand up and remain standing. Praise God, praise God, praise God. If you're standing up, don't clap. Just receive the applause of the people around you. Praise God. So now we're going to do a prayer together. I am proud of you. So now we're going to pray together. There's four more people in here who are sitting down who should be standing. You know who you are. This is how you always do. It's time to do something different now. two more people. She popped up with a baby. Don't know if the baby's making a decision, but let's say it's three more people. <laughs> we're laughing in the middle of a life-changing moment. God is different than you might think. So we're going to pray together. And then afterwards, they're going to send you to this little place and said, I said yes, because that's what you're saying right now. And it's right back there. The cool thing I like about this is while we're praying and everyone else is just going along their way, you're going to stop and go someplace different to the I said yes section. While everybody else is just going about their business, you're making a different decision to go in a different direction, which is the same thing that God will call you to when you leave this place. So let's pray. So we're going to pray together, and then they normally bring up a white dude to make it official. I don't know why you got to do that, but he'll, he'll be here, trust me. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so I'll pray this prayer, and you repeat it in the privacy of your heart. Dear God, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for me. I thank you that he rose again on the third day. I thank you for dying for my sins. I believe it and I receive it. Come into my heart and have your way, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
You guys are awesome. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Oaks Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. That's right. And we want to let you know that we would love to connect with you through our online family in our OC Online Facebook group. To do that, you can like our Oaks Church page and click Join Group. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll have access to life-giving sermons and worship that will be a blessing to you and your family. Yeah, we'd love to have you join us live for our Sunday and Wednesday services. We hope you have a great day today. Thank you for watching and God bless.